So yes, I'm here to talk to you about um, how to start a program, and if you already have a program started, I'm going to see how you can expand it into um, to what we uh, considered now. <clears throat> when we first started, we only pulled 250 kittens back in 2009, um, and then last year we pulled approximately 2,300 kittens with an 89% survival rate. So this is the information we're going to tell you guys. Um, we don't have any restrictions, age restrictions. We pull anything and everything um, that's about to be euthanized. We do try to save our spaces for the ones that um, have no other outlet. So that's what we're going to discuss. Okay, so we started from nothing, basically. Um, Dr. Ellen Jefferson um, was realizing that the shelters around um, Austin were just automatically euthanizing kittens the minute they walked in the door. Um, our city shelter did not have the budget or the staff to take care of these kittens every two hours, so it's obviously much more humane just to go ahead and euthanize them instead of putting them in cages until um, they just pass. Um, also, the community wasn't even aware of this. When I first started volunteering, I didn't even know that there was this, this huge number of orphan kittens that were getting brought into the shelter on a daily basis. Um, I know in my history, I've never came across a litter of kittens just out in the wild, and you know, it was just so rare to me to see all this happening. Um, but like I said, we pulled 2,300, so it is a huge population of animals that we can save. Um, we had no money, of course, um, no facility, no supplies. Um, I'm going to show you here in a couple slides um, the actual trailer that we started out in. Um, we had no plumbing, no trash service. I was the trash service. That's how that worked. Um, and yes, yeah, so we just had a small group of volunteers. Technically, there was only five of us that really started it. Um, we had five cages, and uh, we basically would take a litter home on the weekends, things like that when we first started out. And we were still able to save 250 kittens, though, with half of an Airstream with only five cages, flipping them as fast as possible. Um, during this time, we did have to be a little bit more selective um, with what type of kittens we were pulling. Um, nowadays, we'll pull anything. I currently have a kitten that was 40-something grams when it was born with Mama. That was two weeks ago, and he is now 99 grams. Still super small, big old eyeballs. I'll bring him out here in a little bit and let you see him. Um, but, Back in the day, we were not able to save those because we didn't have any fosters. So we basically looked at kittens that were um, no ringworm because we wanted to turn our cages faster, get them into foster homes. Um, we did try to stay away from sickness and illness, but you know how that goes. You can pull a healthy kitten the next day, it'll turn sick, things like that. Um, so at the beginning, we were very um, strategic about which animals we pulled because at that time, everything was being euthanized, so us pulling five healthy kittens still saved five lives. Um, so that was basically our goal. Um, after we started pulling kittens, we didn't realize that we were having a lot of contagion happening. Um, URI was going around, things like that. So that's when we started developing our sanitation protocols. Um, at the beginning, we were just weighing a kitten. Uh, feeding it milk and then putting it back. That's all we were doing. Um, our population or our uh, survival rates at that time was going downhill and it was clearly because we weren't seeing how much the bell or the milk that was in the belly, the kitten's belly. So basically what we were doing is we were just letting it suck milk and then we were stimulating and putting it back. But the kitten was wearing the milk, I was wearing the milk, all that stuff so it didn't really drink that much. So just key factor is always to make sure weighing after the kitten. And then another thing was smocks and t-shirts and things like that. We basically were going to, I do that all the time, we basically were going to um, hold a bunch of kittens and then we weren't realizing, we were washing our hands and using separate bottles, but we weren't realizing that they're sneezing on my shirt and then I'm grabbing another kitten and holding up against my shirt. Yes, ma'am. So um, little things like that we learned over the years to where now we have it to where everyone um, is treated separately. So why do we rescue? Well, if you're looking at a numbers, you are going to make your quota just like that. Um, and plus things too, like if you pull um, one adult cat and put it in a cage, and then you can put five to six kittens in a cage. So you're definitely going to be saving a lot more lives um, starting out on this program. Um, 
It's also very vital to know kill if all the 2,300 kittens that I did not pull last year would have been euthanized, it would 100% affect our no-kill status here in Austin, Texas. So this is a great way of, of saying it. And plus, I mean, they're so cute. I mean, it's hard to say no to a cute little kitten. Um, and I know there's people that are cat people and dog people. Dog people love kittens too. So that's another good thing to get those fosters in here. Um, which one should be rescued? I do recommend that if you are going to sit down and start a nursery, that everyone is on the same page of what you will be pulling. Um, you can't have one person in the group that's like, I want to do all ringworm kittens, and then everyone else doesn't want to, because when the time comes, you're going to have a lot of conflict and things like that. So you should, before you even start, just set up some rules. Okay, I hate saying this, but that Siamese kitten, you know it's going to get adopted like that. So you can pull a litter of Siamese kittens, put them in a cage, they'll be gone in a couple of days, right? Um, those are being euthanized at shelters too. So when you're first starting out, until you get the feel of how many foster homes and everything you have, definitely be a little um, pickier about your breeds, the age. Um, sickness, if you don't have um, a vet that's on staff frequently, if you just have, you know, every once in a while going to visit your local vet, um, healthier ones will save a lot of money in the beginning and also you'll find a lot of fosters easier this way. I'm going to try not to talk too much about fosters because I want to make sure I leave that open for Gloria. Um, those who know me know I like to kind of talk and talk and talk and talk and talk so I will try to stop there. Um, but yeah and then gruel kittens. Everyone know what a gruel kitten is? Yeah that's that yummy stuff that when I was Whew, when I was pregnant, I could not smell that stuff or nothing. Um, <clears throat> it's funny, I didn't mind kitten poop, but gruel was the one thing that I was like, no. Um, but yeah, so your people who work eight hours a day, they can get up in the morning, they can make some warm gruel, they can weigh the kittens, they can feed them, come home at lunch, do the same thing, come home from work, do the same thing, do it again before you go to bed. Um, so you have a lot more fosters that are available to do this kind of thing. Um, the bottle babies are going to be harder because you're going to have to have somebody that can either bring them to work, but even if they do bring them to work, they're going to have to be able to get off work and go to the clinic if any emergencies happen. Um, you're also going to, um, you know, there's usually stay-at-home moms, things like that, homeschool parents, so your pool of fosters are going to be very slim. Um, the good thing about that is um, you just want to make sure you flip them really quickly. Um, try to keep them in that, that niche so that way they don't have bottle babies there for eight weeks. You can try to flip them. If they'll let you, a lot of our fosters want to see them to adoption, which I, I don't blame them. And I love that someone said foster fails, because yes, that's, and she's going to touch on that. Everyone talks about foster failing being so bad, but it's not, because they do, they will come back. They might not come back that year, but next year or the year after, they're going to love the kitten they adopted. They're going to miss that experience, and they're going to do it again. So once somebody, don't discourage that. A lot of people want to discourage people from adopting their own fosters because they think they're going to lose a foster. But no, you just, and you get the word of mouth. I mean, it, foster failing is a good thing. Um, pregnant and nursing cats. This is one of my favorite programs. Oh, my gosh, if y'all are not doing this, this is the best experience. Um, so we pull pregnant cats from shelters um, and take care of them. But yeah, so we pull these pregnant mamas, we let them have babies, we cross our fingers, they only have like two or three. Um, and then she obviously has more than that. But, um, and then we get these little newborns coming in and we just sneak them in with mama. So of course we make sure mom is FELV and FIV negative. Um, because there has been some studies that say that FIV can go through the breast milk, but there's other studies that say it doesn't, but we haven't had enough information on it yet to where we just say no to FIV for that. Other than that, we don't care. If the kittens have FIV, we can put them on a mama without it. It's not going to cause any issues. Um, and then, of course, make sure they're healthy. Um, we also test the kitten that we're going to add on to the mama. We FELV test that kitten just to make sure that it doesn't have anything. And of course, we make sure they don't have any signs of illness because we don't want to get everyone sick. And those mom's hormones are so, I mean, it's, I would say 95% of the time, mom takes the orphan kittens. <clears throat> now, if you strip all the kittens away from the mama and try to put a whole new round on her, 
it's a 50-50 chance, um, especially if there's a beautiful window in her room. She's never coming back down to lay with those babies again. So we usually, with our program, we try to only use the moms twice if they will lay down for another litter, and then that's it. Then she goes on and get adopted out. Um, but like I said, it's, it's usually we just add more kittens. Um, we do up to seven uh, kittens on a time at a baby, on a mom. Um, it doesn't matter age, we mainly go for weight. So if you have a kitten that has its eyes open but still weighs, you know, 130 grams or something like that, and the litter mates are younger but they still weigh around 130, that's what you're wanting. You want them all to weigh around the same so one's not knocking the other one off, things like that. Um, and this program is also great too because people can work all day long and come home and take care of these guys. So they just need to be weighed twice a day to make sure they're gaining. Um, and of course, yes, understand right off the bat when you're starting, you can't save them all. I actually made that mistake in 2012. Um, I got excited. We partnered up with San Antonio Pets Alive. I don't know if anyone is here um, from that organization, but um, I partnered up with them and I was just pulling, 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 pulling. Well, that's when we had Pan Luke hit us like crazy. <clears throat> that was our Pan Luke year. Um, and uh, we weren't taking proper protocols. We were just sticking them in carriers and stacking them on top of each other. And we spread Pan Luke, basically. Um, so you want to make sure that right off the bat that you know what your limitations are. We now, I now have a, um, uh, like a sign in the nursery when you come in talking about how many, what is capacity? What is my nursery's capacity? I usually do it by cages. I have 50 cages in the nursery, so that's my capacity is 50 litters in the nursery. Um, that way if somebody's blowing up your phone and like, really, can you please, please, please take these guys, it's going to be a waterfall because you're going to take it from Susan and then you're going to take and then Tyler over here is going to want you to take from them and then you're just going to, you have to have some kind of policy in fact or you're just going to make everyone sick, which is not cool. Um, but you can save most of them, though. That's the ideal part. Um, do what you can do. Uh, a plan, of course, medical team. Uh, most of these little, well, almost all of our guys that come to us do require some kind of medication. Um, water. <laughs> so, yeah, so when we first started, we were in a trailer and we only had the five cages and there was no running water. We had to bring our water in with our gallons when we came in to volunteer. Um, we brought the trash home with us. We brought the laundry back home with us. Um, we, we did have a refrigerator, a microwave, and a window unit, an AC that was okay, but <clears throat> no restrooms, nothing. It literally was a shell. Um, that we plugged into an outlet. So, um, so basically, yeah, you can, uh, that's all you need to start basically is just a roof over your head with, a, uh, with some electricity and, of course, people that are willing to go do it. So, where to keep the babies? So, here's our trailer that I was talking about. And if you look from here over was our nursery, and from here over was a cattery. Um, so on this front part here is where we just had five wire cages, small cages, um, that we kept our babies in. Now the only way we can make this work is if you have fosters. Because of course if you have a building that you're just pulling kittens in, you're going to run out of space and then you're done. So this is just basically a pit stop. So what was happening in Austin is we were getting, um, you know, 20 to 30 kittens a day. There's no way we were able to find that many fosters in that short a time. And they only had two-hour deadlines from our shelter because that's what they needed to be fed and that was going to be ethically what they can do at that time. So basically, um, so yeah, so once we pull them into the nursery, that's when my foster team is immediately trying to find foster for them. Uh, we also train all our fosters so nobody has to have any experience at all. So we. We are creating our own fosters. So we're not going out into uh, the community and trying to find people that are already fosters. We're making them because we can't, I mean, there's just not enough people out there to do that. Um, reach out to your community for donated space, funds, things like that, um, and then <laughs> relocate. So we started in that trailer and then we were very lucky to move into our own spot that we leased um, to one room that had 16 cages. So we went from five cages to 16 cages um, and we did 1,200 that year. Um, 
And unfortunately, I didn't start doing my survival rates until 2013, so I'm not sure exactly what my survival rate at that time was. But um, um, of course, when your program grows to where you're going to have those 16 cages and more kittens, um, you want to make sure that you have a convenient spot for transports and for foster transfers. Um, all of our transports from the shelter to the nursery, that is all from our volunteers. Um, the, how we get people to drive to the shelter and pick them up for us is we allow them to name the kittens. It's kind of like a little perk for them. We do do the um, hurricane system when naming our kittens. That's how we keep them organized. Um, they basically, uh, <clears throat> when we first started, <laughs> kind of funny story. When we first started, we were naming them like the Seinfeld letter or the Monster letter or something like that, but um, as, uh, as the younger people started coming, they were like, who's Seinfeld? So we couldn't even say that. Isn't that sad? But anyway, um, so then I was like, okay, well, we can't say Kramer because they're not going to get Kramer's part of the Seinfeld letter. So now we decided to do hurricane system. A1, first litter that comes in the season, we go through the Z's, then you start back at A2. Um, we currently are pulling X1 right now of the season, so we've been through the alphabet to X right now. Um, but we figured everyone knows their alphabet, everybody knows their numbers, so that's how we keep um, uh, inventory of our animals. So if somebody's sick or something like that, someone can say, uh, Brownie threw up. Well, I know Brownie is in the B letter, or B letter because his name starts with a B, and it just kind of makes everything really simple, um, easy to communicate, things like that. Um, I know all those A numbers get all crisp and crossed and things like that, so we usually go by the names. Um, sinks are great. <laughs> um, that's one thing that we didn't have in our last location. Um, we were using hand sanitizer which I personally do not recommend that at all. If there's a sink in the room, throw the hand sanitizer out because people are going to do the hand sanitizer before the sink. Now, if you don't have a way of any running water, then of course the hand sanitizer will do at least something, but usually it doesn't, and I feel like people, uh, you know, if you have urine or poop on your hands and you go over there and put hand sanitizer on it, you're really not doing that much, right? So. Um, if you have a sink, please recommend all your guys to wash your hands anytime they touch an animal and before they touch any of the community uh, things, which we'll get, we'll get into that a little bit later on. Um, <clears throat> if you have space, two microwaves in each feeding area we have found out has changed our world. Um, when you put a, a snuggle safe disc in the microwave for four or five minutes, Everyone's just standing there waiting on that microwave to finish. So um, basically we have one for snuggle safe discs and one for bottles. So that way you could have multiple people in a room feeding and you're not waiting on each other to get to what you need to do. Yes, and they're super cheap. We've never bought one. I have a dungeon, we call it the dungeon. We have our um, storage area that has um, basically 10 microwaves just sitting back there waiting for us to use. Everyone loves to give away microwaves, so if that's a great donation key. Same with washer and dryers. People love donating washer and dryers as well. Um, so you can't, <laughs> you can't really have a nursery without the washer and dryer because your laundry is out of control. Um, we change the cages for our grill babies every four hours. So, um, and you know kittens, they'll mess it up in an hour anyway. So um, we're constantly going through through laundry and things like that. Paid feeders, um, we, ha we do have paid feeders now. Our paid feeders are from six in the morning to 10 in the morning. And then we have more that are at 10 o'clock at night till three in the morning. So our nursery is open from 6 a.m. to 3 a.m. ideally. Um, usually, sometimes they'll stay a little longer than three, but those are our core hours that the nursery is open. And we just hire people basically for the shifts that we can't find volunteers to do. Um, so that's why we chose the shifts we have. What were your two shifts again? Oh, uh, 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. and then 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. Yes. So it's a four-hour morning shift and a five-hour night shift. And that's, of course, seven days a week during kitten season. Um, our nursery is usually open for about eight months during the year. Interns. Oh, yay. Interns are so fun. Um, basically, you, they have zero experience, and you just tell them to come in 15 hours a week, 
over the summer on their summer break and you teach them everything that they need to know and they will do it. It's so awesome. I Free as well. I tell them I give them a, a neonatal care certification, which is basically just something I print off the internet and write their name on it and there you go. Um, they're not doing it for the certification. They're doing it for the hands-on experience. They're doing it for their resume. I also write recommendations for these people as well um, to go into med school, things like that. So if you live anywhere near a college, community college, anything like that, um, you'll get vet interns and any type of medical interns, nurses, things like that, because they'll get hands-on needle use, things like that. More kittens, more structure. Yes, so after I made the big boo-boo of 2012 and pulling all those kittens in there and disease spread, 2013 we decided to start our all-in, all-out protocol. Now on this year, this is our first year that we hit 90% survival rate. <clears throat> we pulled in 2013, we pulled, let's see, this is 17, we pulled 1,500 kittens in 2013 with the 90% survival rate, and I owe it all to this all in, all out. Basically what it is, is you see we have three rooms, and if you don't have three rooms, you can still make them into rooms. The biggest key is you just gotta make sure you have everything in one room that you don't have to go into another room and get. So, room A, the chairs stay in room A. Microwaves, of course, stay in room A. People stay in room A. Um, the clothes, the food, whatever. So basically when a volunteer will come in, they'll ask the volunteer that's in the room A, they're like, hey, do you need anything? Sure, I need some 409. So they'll go to our clean area, get the 409, get whatever they need, go into the room, and then start feeding. Now, if they run out of snuggle safe disc or a chair broke or something like that, they would never ever go into room B or room C to get anything. So that means you have to have enough supplies on hand outside of the room that are clean and, and decontaminated to pull into the room. So that way you know 100% if a kitten breaks in room A with Pan Luke, there's no way that those germs can go into room B or room C. So that way you can shut down room A and continue to pl uh, place kittens in the other rooms without having to stop. Now without this procedure, if you only had one room and you broke with Pan Luke or Khaleesi or anything like that, um, you would just have to shut the room down. And then all those kittens at the shelter would not have an outlet. <clears throat> so this, this is great. It is a lot of work. Like I said, you have to make sure that you have three of everything. You have to have fridges in every room, microwaves in every room, chairs in every room, scales in every room, pens and markers and trash cans and everything. And you have to make it really clear to the people that go in there that you cannot go anywhere else. Um, in front of these rooms, we also have little bleach buckets. Um, I know that when organic matter hits bleach, it doesn't, you know, it's not as effective, things like that, but it's a mindset. Like if you have a bleach bin right in front of your, your room that you're gonna go feed in, and you have to step in it and do all this stuff, it's automatically you're knowing you're going into a, an area that you need to keep clean. Um, we do that a lot, and I just replace it. And plus, it does kill some of the germs, so, Nothing is better than, um, or something's better than nothing. Um, and we only change them, like I just grab a dish towel and put some diluted bleach in it, and I only do it like twice a day, in the morning and at night, just to kind of keep it. But it is one of those things that when you see that and you have to mentally step into it, it kind of gives you that feel of, okay, I'm in kitten work mode. I need to make sure I'm clean and sanitized. Um, so yeah, we do have an intake area as well. Um, that's just when the first kittens, when they come to us, we medically intake them. Um, we don't put them into a population or into a room until we do know their FELV status. Um, if they are FELV positive, we do have a separate room. It's called our overflow room that we put them in. Uh, the only reason why we do that is just because we don't want them accidentally getting put into another cage without, with non-FELV kittens. Um, but we don't, you know, we don't euthanize. We still find fosters for them. We're getting a screen, which from Ikea, and we're just gonna put like a little screen up so that way when the volunteers come in, if any of them are squeamish about needles and blood and that kind of stuff, that they don't have to see it. Um, plus sometimes when you're drawing blood on a little tiny kitten neck and you have a bunch of people like hovering over you, it's kind of intimidating too. So um, 
We just have basically, it's a, which I hope you all can come to the tour on Tuesday um, at between 1 and 3 um, so you can see the setup. But yeah, it's just a little room now that we have just like a little enclosed area that we have all our stuff in. So, But we do have a fourth room that's called Overflow, and that's basically where we put the FLV and things like that. And then um, training, that was another thing that we didn't have when we started. I basically, we were pulling people off the streets and say, here's a bottle, feed this kitten. Um, during that time, we were realizing aspiration was happening, kittens on their back. Um, we were in the trailer outside of Congress, and I pulled up one time, and there was somebody outside with the little kitten in their hand just walking around, and it was horrifying to me. So, um, so we got a training right away. Like We immediately started getting a training together, so that way everyone is on the same boat. Um, the key to this, though, is just to make sure your trainers are excellent. Like, that's the best person, because if you have someone you're not really confident in, they're going to spread that word to every other person, and then it's going to spread like wildfire. Everyone's going to be doing the wrong thing. Um, so your trainers have to be top-notch, and you have to keep retraining them. Every year we do a workshop training. Um, basically, at the end of the season, um, we get together our lovely Becky here, who is our training coordinator. Yes, in my button pusher. She uh, basically uh, does a nice PowerPoint presentation. We get everyone on board with any protocols we changed during the off season, um, any problems we had last year, um, things that we saw that somebody did it and then four other people saw do it and now it's everybody's doing it, changes that we need to do. Um, so that way everyone's uh, up to date and they're not allowed to volunteer until they attend that training because we want to make, we don't want that one person not getting that update People don't read their emails, so you don't want that person not to get that update and then cause a, a really big sanitation no-no. Anyone who walks into the nursery has to go to the, the workshop so they know. All right. So, yeah, training must be more for, formal. You'll need to integrate paid feeders, um, must maintain quality and integrity at all times. I treat my paid feeders just like my volunteers. They are exactly the same except for one gets paid and one gets – one has to ask off more often, I guess. Yes, but, um, but volunteers, I make them do a commitment. They have to do a weekly three-hour shift on a reoccurring basis to order, even to get trained. Um, we do this because if you only come in and volunteer once a month, you're going to be very slow at your feeding. You're going to be fumbling around, trying to look for everything. And during that time, your first hour of your shift is going to be you just getting your stuff together when you should be feeding kittens. Um, that's, of course, the whole volunteer opportunity is to go in there and actually feed kittens. That's the only reason why we can pull them ethically and keep them in the nurseries if we have people in there to feed them. Um, so, yeah, so we made it weekly so that way they up to date with all the protocols, they're fast, and I can look at my calendar and see, okay, I have 100 volunteers. I know I have 100 shifts that are filled. Done. You automatically know that. You don't have to sit there and, and try to schedule this person for every other Wednesday and every third. It's going to take all your time just organizing your volunteers. I have over 100 volunteers, so it takes a very long time to do this. But if you go ahead and tell them Tuesdays at 6 is my shift, and they only have to count, uh, communicate to you if they can't make it, and there's rules that we have with that too. They, it's their responsibility. If it's less than 24 hours, we have like a Yahoo group that everyone's on. We're, we're switching to Google group. Yahoo group has a lot of hiccups, just to let you know. They, things don't get sent on time, so if you use that, I really would rethink that. Um, but um, just if they need to cancel for some reason, their car broke down, they'll just email the group and say, hey, I can't come in. Who can come in for me? And then that person who misses has to do a makeup shift. So I still have 100 shifts that are covered. Does that make sense? Um, so that way we put the responsibility kind of back on them instead of me having to plea and beg and try to get all these people to come and, and do their feeding shift. And you'll need more supplies. This is basically what I was saying earlier. Um, yes, you've got to have enough tables in every room so you're not having to, that's, that's the biggest thing. You can't go to your, your volunteers and say, hey, don't go in that room to borrow anything. But then stick them in a room where they don't have anything to use. So, um, because when it comes down to it, they're still going to go in that room and take it. So you always have to make sure there's tons of supplies for everyone to take um, so they can get the job done. Um, yeah, these cardboard boxes, 
the, what the food comes in. That's a post office one. That's what we use for litter boxes. It's people collect them. <laughs> Us crazy ladies go through HEB and just start pulling food out of the trays and filling up our carts with it. No shame. <laughs> No shame, and I tell you what, they like it because guess what those people are going to have to do? They have to do the same thing. They're going to have to get that carton and stick it in the recycling and take it off. So nobody keeps that stuff anyway, um, and that's just free. And it's great for kittens with diarrhea because why would you scoop? I mean, if you have five kittens and that box is just going to be destroyed in an hour, especially if they have diarrhea, just pick the whole thing up, throw it away. That way if they have coccidia or anything like that, you're already throwing the contagion away so they can't start reinfecting themselves. Um, create a wish list for donations. This is my Gloria's job. She loves doing that. She's great at it. Um, we just have an Amazon wish list that every, every season we just put stuff that we need and she updates it and moves stuff to the front that we have and things that we don't have. Um, but if you think about it, most of your paper towels, cleaning supplies, bleach, um, you can keep, you can ask for it now and keep it for years on end. You know, it's it's not like it's going to expire. So, if somebody has it, you got to make space for it because you will definitely need it. Um, and then repurpose items. So basic care. <clears throat> so of course, all our babies they cannot maintain their own warmth, so we have to do that for them. Um, in the nursery, we use Snuggle Save discs. We do that just because we don't have all the outlets in the world to plug all these nice heating pads into it. And plus, it would be a huge disaster us tripping everywhere. Um, so we have feeders that come in from 6 a.m. to till 3 a.m. at night to feed our bottle babies every two to three hours. All our gruel babies we do every four to five hours. Um, this is where we do our way fee way. So basically, you're going to take your little empty belly. You're going to weigh how much that kitten is in grams. Super important, 28 grams in an ounce. If a kitten loses one ounce, that is 28 grams. That is, if, a, a, if you have a 150-gram kitten and it loses an ounce, you're in trouble. That's a fading kitten right there. So you always do in grams. Um, that way you can uh, access if there's going to be, if you're feeding enough, things like that. And then after you fill up the baby with 5%, um, in your handouts that we passed out, there is a chart that already has all the math for you. So you basically hang that thing up in your nursery and you're just like, this kitten weighs 100 grams. After I feed it, it should weigh 105. That's all you got to do. No math, no counting, no ticks, nothing. You literally just stick it in the scale until it hits the weight it needs to hit, um, which would be 5% of its body weight. Dilutions, we do dilute our KMR. The reason why we do this is for diarrhea. Kittens that go straight from mom or straight from whatever to a two to one mix, you're gonna have lots of diarrhea, which causes dehydration and weight loss, which causes fading kittens. So we have this set up to basically, just for your first four feedings, you're gonna do one part powder, eight parts water. After that four, then you go to the four to one. So one part, four parts water, then you do the two to one. That's just slowly introducing the milk replacement to the kitten, so that way you prevent diarrhea. This all should happen within 24 hours, so don't worry about the kitten not getting enough nutrients. Um, the weight might plateau for a little bit just for the first day because of it, because it's not as much powder as it is water, um, but if you don't, then you have the diarrhea that lasts for days as well, so it's here or there. So anyone, even if a mom, if a, a kitten that's on a mom that needs supplementing, you should still introduce the milk to them slowly. So you still would want to do the eight to one, four to one, two to one. So yeah, basically it's just you introducing, anytime you got to introduce a formula, you want to do that first. And I do this even if another shelter sends me bottle baby kittens that their foster has been doing it, I still do it because I just, you don't know what milk they were starting them on either. And switching formulas can cause real, like havoc on their GI tracts. I've had kittens, unfortunately, not make it just because um, they wanted a certain brand. We had them on a different brand, and it caused a lot of vomiting and stuff. So, Wet food, basically, um, this age we just basically gruel. So we just put some uh, wet food mixed with some water. 
We add the water for hydration purposes. Kittens at this age do not lap up water on their own, so that's how you keep them hydrated. And always warm, you want your kittens warm. Everything touching them, dry, warm, always. Um, we'll also talk about when to feed kibble and meds, who will administer them. Um, we do have, we're lucky that we have some med techs on staff now. Um, we have morning and night meds that we do. We also have a lot of protocols that should be in your handbook if you purchase them. I don't think it's in the handout that I gave you, um, but we have a lot of uh, URI protocols, diarrhea protocols, things like that, that you could just hand over to your vet and just be like, can you sign off on this? And then you should be able to do it yourself. And so monitoring your progress. So all the kittens that are in the nursery get weighed every single day, well, multiple times a day. So they get fed every two to three hours that they get fed. Girl babies get fed every four to five hours, or weighed every four to five hours. Um, we put all this into our shelter. We use Shelter Love as our management system. Um, if you guys use Pet Point, you can do the same thing out of Pet Point as well. Um, you just run your location history, and it will show up all the kittens that are in your nursery. And we print that out on a daily basis, and we write down the first morning weights next to them. We compare it over a 24-hour period to make sure every kitten in there is gaining. We enter all that information into Shelter Love, which is a great volunteer thing. If you have any volunteers that want to work from home, entering all this stuff in there is, is a lifesaver. Um, and that way we can see if they're actually gaining over a 24-hour period. It's kind of hard to see sometimes when you um, are comparing weights throughout the day. Um, because they do go up and down. Sometimes, you know, they won't poop until the very end of the night. And then all of a sudden you weigh them and you're like, ah, you lost weight. Um, this is how to know for sure that they are on a steady gaining basis. Um, after 48 hours, if they uh, lose weight compared to our spreadsheet, then we will start our weight loss protocol, which is basically just PIN-G once a day for three days. So um, that magical PIN-G. If y'all have not been using penicillin and LRS together, you guys have got to get on that. That stuff is... Oh my gosh, it's just regular um, pen combo. It's just penicillin, and you literally take one cc and mix it with six cc's of LRS. And we use it for diarrhea, for weight loss. Um, it's a miracle drug. Like after 48 hours, you'll know if it's working. Cool, and then we also do um, med charts. That's another thing you just gotta have. Um, we have everything 100% uh, intern friendly so that way when you get those volunteer interns that come in and help with your meds and things like that um, you just make sure that it's um, easily read things like that um, EOD we just do a nightly end of the day kind of just letting everyone know uh, the foster team sends one out letting us know which kittens went to foster um, we let the foster team know which kittens ca came into the nursery that day um, that's just basically how we do our um, get our information out and plus if you have those volunteers that are working at home that enter any of that stuff in it's just a one-stop shop. An example of that is in your handout as well. The daily spreadsheet was what I was talking about earlier about us comparing weights. It's not really a spreadsheet but I don't know why I've always called it a spreadsheet. It's just my my thing and then um, when to transfer from BB program to CAT program. Um, usually this happens when they're around six weeks of age. Um, it, depends on their weight. Usually we like a healthy 1.5 pounds um, and then that's when we no longer ask to be weighed and they don't have to be um, weighed every four hours, things like that. All right, clean, sanitize, decontaminate. So these are different things. Um, the 409 is just a detergent. It is not going to kill any germs at all. Um, the reason why we chose 409 was just because I knew it worked and it was easy just to tell people. Now yes, there are probably generic brands of this that have the same ingredients and things like that, but I don't have time to read all these bottles. So for the volunteers, I basically just say, this is what I want. If you want to donate, this is what it is. And that limits your back and forth conversations on emails, you winding up with a whole closet full of supplies that you don't even need, you gotta find a place to put it, um, where it goes. So yeah, so we only, we just make it simple, we want 409. Now we only use 409 just for organic matter. So when you're cleaning the cages, you'll just don't put your head in there for too long or you will pass out. But um, like if there's some grill stuck on the cage or poop or something, you just do a little shot of 409, scrub it off, then you'll go ahead and use your trifectant um, or you'll use your uh, diluted bleach if it's a ringworm. That's our ringworm protocol. 
Ringworm protocol is just basically we use bleach instead of trifectant. Um, we also have gloves in the rooms if people want to use gloves while handling the ringworm guys. Um, us OGs, we just wash your hands after it. We don't care. Um, but there are some people that, you know, so, um, and then the FIV and FVLV protocols, we, FIV, we don't care. We don't even test for it in the nursery. Does not matter to us at all. Yes, ma'am. Rescue, yes. Uh, that's like, it used to be Excel. Yes. So Excel was compared to bleach. So we would use the Excel. So yes, so we're poor and we can't use the Excel. But back in the day when I wanted it, um, we were going to use it for the ringworm protocol and it worked great. But we just can't afford it. And it's called Rescue now, yeah. So yeah, so bleach is cheap and it's really hard for me to like bargain that one where I get it not only donated for free as well, and it's still, we don't seem to have a problem with just using the 10 to 1 dilution for um, the spray bottles for ringworm. Um, and then like I said, FIV, it does not matter. We don't even test for that, only the mom cats. Um, we do test for the FLV, and then once we do, we just put them in a separate cage and flea foster for them. They're still fed, they're still everything. Um, we're actually doing some studies, uh, FLV studies right now um, that are, <laughs> mind blowing about the virus and how it can live in different areas and how it, it can, a, a positive cat can turn negative and all this great information out there right now. Um, I don't know enough about it to kind of talk about it too much, but it's exciting. So hopefully, um, hopefully more shelters will stop euthanizing FBLV cats. That's hopeful. Um, and they shouldn't be euthanizing FIV. That, that should not be happening. So if you see anyone, tell them to stop doing that. Um, quarantine procedure for more serious contagions such as Panluke or Khaleesi. Um, we did have Panluke in the nursery last year. Um, we actually had over 250 kittens that came with it. Um, we do have our um, Panluke ward that's inside our Parvo ward right now. So other shelters when they came down with kittens with Panluke, we would pull, pull them and put them into our volunteer ran uh, Panluke ward as well. And all we did was take our volunteers from the nursery who were already trained on how to feed and trained them on how to enter the pan loop ward or how to enter the parvo ward and then they would just feed like normal in there. <laughs> Only rule was they could not go back into the nursery after going in there. So they could feed in the nursery then go there and feed and go home afterwards um, but they can't do it the opposite way just in case. All right, key roles. These are very important. Um, rescue coordinator. This is going to be the person who is actually going to communicate between the shelter and your rescue. Um, this person is going to be level-headed and very um, open-minded um, dealing with shelters. Some shelters, you know, um, just don't have this, are overwhelmed, overburdened, things like that. So you want to make sure your rescue person is um, accepting that sometimes the shelter is just going to not give you any info. Um, some of the things we do is we ask for pan loop tests. If kittens are coming and they're saying, hey, can you pull this kitten? It's got bloody diarrhea and vomiting. Of course, we're going to ask for a pan loop test first before we pull that kitten into the nursery just so we don't expose the nursery. Um, and sometimes a lot of the other shelters just don't have the bandwidth to do that. It's too expensive, things like that. Um, so you want to make sure your rescue person who is in charge of uh, being your liaison between the two is, is um, very respectful and very um, knows that, you know, the ultimate goal is kittens to make sure we have a healthy relationship between each other. Um, they also have to know the perp, uh, nursery population. That's another thing that's on the EOD, if you notice it's in your handout. At the very end, it has a cage count. That tells, me how, that tells us how many open cages we have in a room, so that way my rescue coordinator already knows she can pull, we have five empty cages, she can pull five litters that day. She doesn't have to text me back and forth, hey, can I pull another litter, hey, can I take this litter, blah, blah, blah. She already knows that she has five cages and she can do what she can with that. Uh, foster manager is going to be super important. Um, it was a volunteer position with us for several years before it became paid, so it can be a volunteer position, but you got to make sure that volunteer is going to be on it. Because remember, this is going to be supporting your nursery, right? So, or your nursery is supporting basically your foster team. So if your foster manager goes out of town for a whole week, no kittens are going to move for a whole week. That means if you fill up during that time, you can't pull any more from the shelter. Um, so the foster manager has got to be on top of it. Um, must know nursery population. Um, they are going to recruit and train new fosters. So like I said, it does not even matter 
at all. If you have zero experience at all, if you have a safe place for them to go and you have the time to do it, this is what you, um, you'll just train them yourself. And we do one-on-one -on -one trainings with the litter that you're going to take home. So if somebody applies for a litter of kittens and they're like, um, hey, I want to foster, but I work, I can come home at lunch. Our foster manager is going to pair that person up with a litter of kittens that only need to be fed every four hours. Because if you let the, the fosters choose, they're going to choose a little tiny cute kitten that wiggles its ears, not knowing that, oh, on Saturdays I have my kids' soccer games all day long and they're not going to get fed in time. And then they're going to contact her and be like, hey, I need a babysitter tomorrow for this kitten. Um, and so you have to kind of pull the information out of the fosters and make sure you do the matching. Training coordinators the same way. Um, you got to make sure, like I said, they're all trained correctly the way you want it done. Um, we do, we have the training, we do shadowing, which we do hands on. So everyone comes in and sits down for a two hour presentation to see what the program's all about. This weeds out the people who think you're going to go in there, pet a little kitten, put a bottle in its mouth, and go home. Um, we go over fading kitten protocol with ours to let them know hey, this is a neonatal ICU unit, right? So you are going to come in with fragile kittens that can't have germs, need to be nice and warm and clean, needs to be fed on time, uh, things like that. So you want to make sure you weed out all the volunteers that are not going to be committed to the program. And then um, must be knowledgeable program policies, yes. Keeping volunteers. Happy hours! That's how you keep volunteers. Um, also appreciation and gratitude. Um, we, uh, I have to admit we don't do appreciation and gratitude as much as we should. We do it more in the off season than we do during the season because we're all running around like crazy people, kittens coming out of our ears. But we basically try to get together and do a couple of happy hours. We do do a Christmas party at the very end of the season. I make really good jello shots. Um, <laughs> And it's all donated, too. It's like everyone, yeah, everyone just brings their own, you know, what to drink. And then we have um, try to save up some money for people to cater or bring your own food. And we all just get together, do ele white elephant gift exchange, and it's really fun. Um, and then just, you know, when you're, just make sure you're talking to your volunteers where you're there in the nursery. Um, hey, thanks for coming in. You know, if somebody came in to fill in for somebody, make sure you thank them loudly in front of a lot of people. Um, that works great. Um, team spirit and make it fun. And then raising money. All right, so this is the fun part. We basically do calendars where we have the fosters for that season. So if you fostered for 2017, you would submit your photos of your kit, one photo, and then we put it on like a uh, razoo and people vote on it and the top 13 kittens that get voted on go into our calendar so the money that the people voted on is a dollar a vote we use that money to print the calendars and then the winner gets the cover of the photo or cover the the calendar so it, we raised three thousand dollars on the voting of a calendar which it only cost me five hundred dollars to print a hundred of them I think or I can't remember how much it was. I don't pay the bills. So, um, but it was super, it was cheap. We made out good. And so, and then we sold them for like $15 a piece. What was the voting software you use? I think it's Razoo. Razoo is what we do. But it's, it has like, it's really cool. It has like the little, um, you know, tick marks so you know which one's in the lead. And it's fun because everyone will check in at midnight, like right before midnight to see who's winning. And then you'll throw another 20 on your one you like. It's it's kind of fun. Same thing with the t-shirts. Um, we have our, so that's for our fosters basically. We let them turn in the pictures and then they get the pictures in the calendar. And then the t-shirts themselves, um, we have our volunteers submit designs um, or even just ideas. So basically they will just flat out be like, hey, I want to have a little army kitten with a little, you know, bottle in his hand that says I'm a feeder or something like that. And then we have a, I just have a volunteer that does web stuff and she'll just design something for us and we vote on it. Once again, all the money that's raised on voting we use for the printing. Yes. <laughs> and then we also do like baby showers. We do a baby shower once a year. It's the only time the public can come into the nursery. 
only time means everyone's going to come out and you get tons of paper towels and, and that's how you do it. You don't ask for money. You say, hey, you want to come toward the nursery? Bring six, a six pack of paper towels or bring three gallons of bleach and that would be their entrance in and then they get to do a little quick tour that's guided, um, no touching, we don't allow photos or anything like that, but um, they get to see what we're actually doing in the community and how a six pack of paper towels might not mean nothing to them, but it means a lot to us and how much we go through it. Because we go through a six pack of about every three hours in the nursery. And then, of course, rich people are nice too, you know. <laughs> if you know any of them, go ahead and hit them up as well. And then, yay! So then we're going to take a quick little break.